I tried to do a presentation that was going to not overlap with some of the other conversations, so I'll be taking things in a little bit of a different angle. Uh, I did want to start because I did manage to get caught rolling my eyes earlier about the, the famous $150 million that McKinsey, who's my former employer, so I shouldn't say anything negative about them, but I will because that number is just completely a fake number. Uh, <laughs> I, I keep telling the government folks they have to stop using that number, and they're like, but we have to sell these policies. I'm like, but it's a fake number. Why is it a fake number? Because they're basically saying, if we were to equalize employment and opportunity for women as, as we have for men in our economy, we would somehow magically get $150 million. But it doesn't account for the fact that uh, we might not have someone to take care of our children if we just include these women. There's no calculation for the cost that would be required for childcare. We don't know if there would actually be jobs. Uh, we don't know if a whole bunch more women entered the economy if uh, the, all the wages would be suppressed because there would be more demand for jobs than there are jobs that are available. Um, and so we don't know what the impact would be on also the men who are currently employed. So to say $150 million without considering the whole ecosystem of the economy, I think is hugely problematic. And I think it's problematic in terms of the policies that the government is promoting and why I'm so excited for this initiative to really be more thoughtful about what we can actually do when we think more broadly about the ecosystem. And I think the talks that have gone out so far today really point to some of those opportunities. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a, why I got called out for rolling my eyes. So I, 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 I wear my emotions on my sleeve, and so I apologize for that. I got to get better at that. OK, so let me give you some perspective of where we're coming from at the Institute for Gender and the Economy. Um, so you know, when we talk about gender equality, and the things that we're talking about in entrepreneurship, but also all the other ways that we're talking about inclusion of women and uh, non-binary people and people of color and indigenous people in the economy, we're actually not going forwards. We're almost going backwards. That we haven't, uh, you know, the promise in 1986 when I first came out of university that somehow things were going to be fixed for my generation turns out not to be true because now I have gray hair and things aren't fixed. So um, we have to be doing something different. We have to challenge ourselves to be more innovative about the solutions and not just you know, shove women into the existing ecosystem. And why this, uh, the, why the WEC is so interesting to me is because it's really intervening on the ecosystem level and saying, can we create a different kind of ecosystem? Uh, one that would have different kinds of measures of what performance and outcomes are. One that might uh, accommodate all the different kinds of people who, and the ways that they want to uh, be gainfully employed or to uh, make money in the economy. So this challenge is particularly uh, 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 problematic when we start to think uh, very carefully about intersectionality, about differences in ability, uh, race, indigenous status, and everything like that. that Often when uh, policy is being made, it focuses just on the binary and it doesn't consider these, the, the importance of the intersections or, uh, as, as uh, pointed out, we have basically no data at all on non-binary and transgender people in the economy. And we have a big project at the Institute uh, for Gender and the Economy actually to uh, get put together some data on that topic. So hopefully we'll know more over the coming uh, years on that topic. So we have to be very thoughtful about, how, uh, about the kinds of policies that we put uh, in place. And of course, where we do have numbers, it's on women on boards because now we have Comply or Explain. And it turns out that with four years of Comply or Explain, the needle has moved from here to like here. So maybe a little bit of progress, but not nearly as much as we would have liked, including the fact that if we look at the publicly traded companies, still only 4% have women CEOs. And I talk about this even in a conference about entrepreneurship because I think that employment and in companies is very closely related to these questions about entrepreneurship. Because if, you know, uh, and Wendy talked about the fact that women do get, you know, pushed out of uh, or pushed into entrepreneurship sometimes. And I think it's really true. If you are working in an employment context that's not inclusive, uh, either because it's unpleasant or you've been sexually har harassed, as we heard from uh, Councillor Wong Tam, you are going to leave that and look for something else. And so there is a lot of that Plan B entrepreneurship going on. And it would be much better for many people. Uh, again, Councillor Wong Tam mentioned the gig 
economy. We, everyone's touting the gig economy as this great solution for women who want a flexible lifestyle. I'm like, first of all, the reason women want a flexible lifestyle is because they're expected to do all the house, house care and all the child care and all the elder care. And like, why is that the case? Uh, it's, it, it, we really need to also be working on the whole sharing of those kinds of things in the family. So then we're, we're already kind of essentializing the fact that women want that. No, women don't necessarily want it. Women are forced into it because of these social expectations. Uh, then they want, then because of that, they might want flexible work, but the gig economy is not a great solution. We have a brief that's just come out on that, a policy brief uh, that talks about all the ways that the gig economy is actually even more biased and has many fewer protections than ga regular gainful employment with benefits. And quite frankly, for most people, they might just want a job that has benefits and regular hours and entrepreneurship isn't going to be for them, but they've been sort of, quote, forced into it. So what we really want is to create an entrepreneurship ecosystem that works for the people who actually want to be entrepreneurs and create an economic ecosystem that works for the people who would like to work in you know, a different kind of job. Um, because we don't want to force people to be entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship, I think we've over... Uh, emphasize this as the solution for women, entrepreneurship is highly risky. So we want to we want to make sure that it's a solution for the women who actually want to be entrepreneurs and that we have other solutions in our economy that aren't. So um, so gap is closing. You know, here the statistic I like to show is, you know, we have almost as many men named John as all women uh, CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies. So if your name is John, good for you. You're, you're, you're likely to have more statistically likely to have success in the leadership realms. And this plays out, you know, in the corporate level, but it also plays out in the Silicon Valley entrepreneurship space. And one of the things that I think irritates me personally is how much we have decided somehow amongst policymakers and, and the, the power brokers in Toronto that we want to be the next Silicon Valley. And I'm like, I'm from California, and let me tell you, you to, do not want to be the next Silicon Valley. It's not working out for very many people. School teachers are homeless because they cannot afford to live in, you know, so you have people teaching our children who are homeless in Silicon Valley because of the cost of living. That is not an, that is not something we want for Toronto. I'm an immigrant to Canada and I keep saying the inclusive innovation solution is the solution. We really have to go for that. Canada has this opportunity to be the beacon of light around, uh, globally around some of these issues. And I think this hub that w is being created is really part of creating those alternative models. And I just want to keep uh, pressing on that. So, okay. So our role at GATE, G Institute for Gender and the Economy, is to use rigorous research, to take that academic research. So I know you kind of dissed randomized control trials, but sometimes those actually are pretty necessary to understand, to separate out different effects. And so the rigorous research that we use, we want to bring that to light. Because honestly, practitioners should not read our wonky academic journals. No one should read Administrative Science Quarterly. It's not, you know, it's for us technicians. It's not for practitioners. So what do we do to take that research and make it make sense and make it shape policy, that's really what we're trying uh, to do in our, in our work. And so one of the things that we are really poking, trying to poke a hole in is this myth of meritocracy um, that we have sort of, a, you know, the reason that women aren't included in entrepreneurship or aren't included in the corporate world or aren't included on corporate boards is somehow because uh, that we can't find the women. Uh, and so here's the stats from the board seats held by women in Canada, still a low number. And when you actually go through, we have a big project going through the explanations in Comply or Explain, which are buried in their, in their circulars. So it takes, it's taken us three years of RAs just reading PDF documents to find the explanations. But most of the explanations come down to meritocracy, they'll say things like, well, we don't want to compromise the principles of meritocracy by including women. Um, we may not get the best candidates, but of course, going to what is the best, that's a whole problem, and I think that's part of what we're trying to talk about here, what is the best. Or they say, we can't find the women. Those are the two big excuses, and this, these excuses get made about corporate boards, they get made about entrepreneurship, they get made about women in STEM, they get made in all these places, and I am just here to tell you that they are false excuses that allow people to go like this. I did my part, I looked, there weren't there, there was no women. Um, and, and this goes back to what we talked about, stereotypes or bias. A lot of people, have, you've seen the implicit association test. I won't go into a detail here, but I just want to say that the most of us, women and men and non-binary people alike, tend to associate women with family and men with careers. 
That's just how we tend to think. Now, I don't want to blame our brains because we've been socialized since before we were born. When you go up to someone, almost the first thing that someone asks if you're, if you're expecting is, is it a boy or a girl? So you're, you're already socialized before you even get born is to like your gender is going to be really important for you. And I have a staff member who just had a kid and she said, well, we're going to have our gender reveal party when the kid's 18. We're going to wait and just see. Uh, <laughs> We're not going to decide now. We're going to, you know, so, so we're socialized this way. And so you can take the implicit association test and learn to hate yourself in a million different ways on race, uh, homophobia, whatever it is. There's, there's a test for you to feel bad about yourself. We are all there. <laughs> so the question is not can we fix our brains, because we know that doesn't actually work, but can we fix the systems that we operate again in? And so what I want to show you is how these, these stereotypes are really being embedded in the systems uh, that we operate in. And I'll just give you three examples. So the one on the far left is you take two identical CVs, you give them to people, and the only thing you manipulate is uh, whether the person's name is Jennifer or the person's name is John, and then you ask them, how hireable is this person? And of course, John is more hireable than Jennifer, but same qualifications, right? You give people computers to use, and the computers all function the same. And you ask them, how much is the computer worth? And then you tell some people that the computer's name is Julie, and some people that the computer's name is, his name is James. And they still think that James is worth more than Julie. It's the same dang computer, right? Or, of course, going to entrepreneurship, if we look at the uh, research that's been done their experiments where you take the exact, because the big excuse in Silicon Valley is, well, women just don't pr propose high quality businesses, and that's why only 2% of our money is going to women. Well, no, actually, uh, if you do the exact same pitch, the same pitch deck, the same economics, the same business plan, the same a narration, and the only difference is that the investor is seeing one narrated by a female voice and one narrated by a male voice, and then you say, is this an investable opportunity? Well, the male voice is twice, is twice as likely to be seen as an investable opportunity than the female voice. So these biases then get embedded into what our criteria are, how we measure, all these kinds of things that have come up. And so we need to think about not fixing the women. Oh, well, the entrepreneurs need to do better pitch decks, or they need to ask more, or they need to whatever it is. We, we need to fix the actual system that they're um, embedded in. So that's, uh, that, that's, that, that's just a way. I don't want to blame it on our brains and then walk away and say, well, we can't fix our brains. I want to say, OK, our brains maybe are unfixable, but can we fix the systems around uh, that, that we operate in that are producing these kinds of outcomes? And then that's not even taking into account that for Je Jennifer to get a CV that looks the same as John's CV, given the barriers that she's been facing all along, she's actually probably a lot better qualified just to have the equal CV, and we're not taking that into account. So so all things equal, if you see two CVs, one with a woman's name and one with a man's name, and you think that they're the same, actually the woman is likely to be much higher quality, and you should always be breaking the tie in favor of the woman. And yet, that concept, when you go into hiring committees and things like that, they're like, oh, it's so unfair for the man. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> I'll just flip my hair on that one. Uh, yeah, we're right in the middle of recruiting, so you can see where I'm, I am. Okay. Then people say, oh, there's some intrinsic differences between men and women, that that's really what it is. It's like biological, like women care more. And I'm like, no, women are socialized to care more. Women are more risk averse. Well, it is true that on average in Canada, women are shorter than men, on average. Women on average are 5'4", and men are on average 5'9". But of course, there's tall women and short men, and there's a distribution curve. And so there's, diff there's some real biological differences on average, OK? Risk seeking, not so much. If you do a meta-analysis of all the academic studies that are out there on, on experiments around risk taking, there's almost no difference between men and women. There's a distribution curve. So there's some men who are more risk averse and some women who are more risk seeking. And, it's, and so, but we have this rhetoric around there being some difference about, around women and men and risk aversion. In fact, what we're finding more and more is in a lot of these economic contexts, if you control for different things that are important co, uh, um, confounds, you actually find that women are more risk seeking. So for example, in a major study of all Swedish, in Sweden they have great data, you can study everyone's investment portfolios in the entire country of Sweden. Okay, and when you look at that, you see on average women are more risk averse in their investments than men. However, if you control for income, women are actually more risk seeking. So what does that say? The reason that women look more risk averse is because they have less money that they need to protect because they have to retire. So if you 
make this claim about risk aversion without understanding that, that the, the risks are actually much higher in many cases for women. Women who do put, if you know that only 2% of money is going to women-led businesses, then if you're a woman-led business and you put yourself in the ring, you're taking a much higher risk than the average male entrepreneur. And yet no one frames it that way. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is change the framing on the conversation. That goes to this whole pipeline conversation. This is just one example in Ontario of people starting out in the math. And then by the time you get to a PhD, or higher education, women are dropping out of the STEM field all the time, and they're like, women just opt out. We don't understand, they just don't choose STEM. But then if you go back to the experiences that Councillor Wong Tam was talking about, you can understand that why women aren't opting out, they're being pushed out. And here's a, 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 a point that I really wanna make, that a lot of times things that we think are supply problems, meaning women don't choose to do this, are really demand problems, meaning the environment is so negative or so hostile that women don't, are being pushed out or are not included. And so we frame it as a supply problem. The women aren't opting in when really it's the environment that's actually causing them to opt out. And so a lot of my writing has been around, let's not confuse a supply and a demand effect or understand how they interact. And here's one example of some colleagues of mine who did a study of women who do uh, internships as part of their engineering program, or all students do internships as part of their engineering program. But what was very nice feature about this particular program is people were randomly assigned to whether they did it fairly early in their academic career as an undergraduate, so in the second uh, year maybe of their undergraduate career, or they did it fairly late in their career. And what they found was that the women students who did their in, uh, uh, internship earlier in their academic career were much more likely to switch out of engineering or to change the kinds of courses that they took because they had a bad experience and they were like, Maybe I don't want to do this. And so then the employers say, we can't find any women in STEM. And I'm like, you produced that problem. You produced that problem by having crappy internships that drove women away. And we don't see the same effect for the men students. So again, supply versus demand, people blame it on the pipeline, but they don't understand how they're producing the pipeline that we're operating in. And so that's another thing that we're really trying to understand more deeply. Um, the things that don't work, we know from research, unconscious bias training is just going to do a backlash unless you couple it with a whole bunch of other stuff, so I'm not a big fan of that. Women's empowerment training uh, often makes women feel really good at the time that they're doing it, but I don't know if you saw the article about uh, uh, the recent large consulting firm that was doing this and it was telling women whatever it was to straighten their hair and just, you know, all the kinds of things that whatever it is that you're supposed to do. Uh, we know that they often make women feel good at the time, but then you go back into the workplace that's not inclusive and it doesn't matter that you've done empowerment training. In fact, you're more deceived because you thought you were empowered and then you're not. So these are some things, so don't do, like don't do those things on their own. Don't do a fix the women's strategy or a fix the brain strategy. Those don't work. It's a fix the ecosystem, it's a fix the structure and that's why this, this project that we are all in this room uh, connected to is so important. We have to stop doing those things that we have, it's like pushing on a string. We keep doing that, we're like, oh, we haven't improved anything, you know, because the system is the system will incorporate all of these efforts and actually turn them on their head like the me too movement which the main net effect of the me too movement is that senior men now say they don't want to mentor women anymore so like literally the patriarchy seems to win every dang time and so we have to figure out how we're going to change the system so that that's not the outcome okay we also talked about what is entrepreneurship uh, and one of the statistics, was, so we were very lucky uh, to be hosting the Minister of Labor, the Women uh, in the Workplace Symposium in May, and we did a lot of pre-work for that as, as a knowledge partner uh, for that effort. And one of the things we did is they were initially very focused on large corporations and what can we do to improve the work of women in large corporations. So we did some research and looked at the stats can get data, and what it basically says is that actually only 0.2% of all enterprises are large plus 500 and only less than 10% of all employees in private employment work in those large companies. Everyone else is working in a smaller, medium-sized enterprise. Everyone else. And yet, those companies are subscale to be able to do diversity and inclusion initiatives. They often don't even have HR leaders. They just have a payroll service. The CEO is doing the HR. And so if we want to fix things for women, we can help them be entrepreneurs, but we can also help smaller firms just do a better job at being inclusive of women in those smaller firms. So to me, when I think of what we could do as part of the WEC, is not only, it's not only the women owner or founder, but it's the people working in those small businesses that we really need to be uh, thinking about. 
So I think this is a pretty important dimension because when you look at these smaller companies, they actually, many of them still have to conform to pay equity, human rights code, and all those kinds of things, but they don't have the resources. They don't have formal HR management. They don't have knowledge and guidance. They don't have data about best practices. And we wrote a research brief about this to highlight these kinds of issues in hopes of pushing the government more towards a capability building mindset as opposed to just a regulation, you must do pay equity. It's like, let's help organizations actually do pay equity. So that's what we're um, trying to focus on. And I think that th th this, to me, feels like also part of what we can do on women's entrepreneurship is also be thinking about entrepreneurial firms that aren't necessarily led by women, but could be employing women. And can they, women, people of color, uh, indigenous people, people with different abilities. I wrote about this and I said, originally, I said because it's 2017 in my article, uh, uh, based on, you know, Prime Minister Trudeau's, you know, justification of why he had a gender balanced cabinet because it's 2015 and I keep crossing it out and it's pretty soon I'm going to have to cross out the two numbers and put 2020 because we're not there yet and when are we going to get there? I always say, I want to retire at some point, so please, can we just move the needle a little bit faster? Uh, so anyway, I'll give you some examples of innovation, ways that we could think about innovation and entrepreneurship for gender equality that isn't just about women in entrepreneurship. So a company called Boxed, which does uh, grocery delivery, they basically have decided that it's completely unfair that women pay uh, a pink tax on different products uh, and on feminine hygiene products in particular. So they do equal prices for equal products, whether it's deodorant, razors, or whatever it is. Uh, they have a reduced list price on all feminine hygiene products, and this is in the US in states that have taxes on them so that women are not actually effectively paying the tax on those products. And it's radically increased customer loyalty, right? So it's really good for the business to do something that's actually gender smart, right? Another example, LV. LV has some questionable products like um, things to help you with your kegels, which apparently you don't really need because you can just do that on your own that are expensive. But this is an example of a breast pump that looks pretty different. I mean, for those of you who've ever pumped, you will know that it's not the most pleasant experience in the world. I don't, I never had children, so I just have seen other people do it and have been horrified. Um, <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, <laughs> yet one more reason I'm not having children. So. But here's a, com here's a new radical innovation that paid attention. We call it the airspace of femtech. We talked about CEO completely changing the model of how you do entrepreneurship. Uh, there's probably much more that, you know, look up what they're doing. It's quite extraordinary. Um, McCarthy Uniforms is a private company. It's a small and medium enterprise. Uh, they, have, they were basically going bankrupt. Uh, and they got, so, so uh, Vanessa Rochi got hired as the CEO to do a turnaround and she did gender analysis as her turnaround strategy. So she figured out that they had all this opportunity to get into the uniform space like bus driver uniforms and things like that and it turns out that the way uniforms work is that most companies don't want to stock female fit SKUs it's because they're just like there's not as many women and so they just tell women to buy the men's size products. They have radically win every RFP they put out there because they do female fit. And the, they had a bus driver who for the first time tried on a female fit uniform and started crying because it was the first time in her life she had a uniform that fit her. And this is just, th this company that was supposed to take four years to do the turnaround has done the turnaround in two years based on this. They also did a gender equity analysis and when they went to the schools, because the school uniform company with the RFP, they presented their products and they also presented their gender equity statement and they said, we would encourage you to ask all of your suppliers for their gender equity statement. None of the other suppliers have it and they're, they're now winning more RFPs. They can't keep up with everything. This is an example of using gender analysis in a small and medium business for strategic reasons and it greatly increases gender equality. So that's what we're really talking about here. Fenty, if you want to talk about Rihanna, paying attention, actually paying attention to what women of color want uh, in their product areas. And all the major cosmetics companies are like, but we have multiple shades. They're like, yeah, but it's not just the multiple shades, it's the way you reach out and talk to your customers. It could only be done by someone like Rihanna who really understands the community. So another what landed is another uh, uh, innovation that's an opportunity to uh, uh, like help your career and help you like refine your CV and think about your career that's geared towards women uh, understanding their career paths. So again, when we talk about entrepreneurship, we can also we can talk about women doing entrepreneurship, but we can also talk about all the opportunities there are in thinking about gender equality for entrepreneurship, and that's the direction that I'm really excited about. So I um, tried to keep us basically a little bit even maybe back on time. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to being part of this community as we go forward.